It's Labor Day weekend, which means that we're now at the conclusion of the summer. We've spent our summer going through your requests for songs, for scriptures, and for sermon topics in the spirit of the MTV show Total Request Live, or TRL. And you have submitted some fantastic requests. In fact, you've submitted so many requests that we were able to fill up two months of sermons, but we've got even more requests that we weren't able to get to this summer that will be sprinkled in on special occasions throughout the rest of the year. Who knows? You asked so many great questions that this could become an annual tradition. So as you've got great questions that come up, write them down to save them for later. Or if you can't contain yourself, just send them on in as you think about them and keep, keep, asking great questions. Well, just to review where we've been this summer, we began by talking about how everybody loves David. Uh, He seems to be given uh, preferential treatment, even though sometimes it looks like he doesn't deserve it. And so we talked about him as, as the very real human being that he is. And then we moved on to the Bible tells me so. And we talked about how teaching the faith to kids is hard work. It's really hard work. So we need to do it well. Then we followed that up with the complicated Paul, Uh, despite what Jen thought. It was not supposed to be about Paul Schillingford, but rather the Apostle Paul. And how his words are sometimes challenging. And sometimes people have an easy time loving Jesus, but a much more challenging time finding some love in their hearts for Paul. So we discussed all of those things. Then we talked about magic magic and, and and why whenever someone else does it it's magic whenever god does it it's it's a it's a mystery or it's a miracle and, and and what's the difference between the two then we moved on to doubt and in fact the important role that doubt often plays in our faith and, and how doubts can actually grow us as we seek to go deeper in our life of faith then we moved on to evolution something that i think is largely Um, an item of the past in terms of the culture wars, but some of us still need, some of us still need to understand that God speaks in many ways, including science. And then last week, boy, if you miss it, it was a hell of a sermon because it was on hell. All right, that was the most requested topic. You can go back and watch that one or any of these on YouTube, on Facebook, on the church website, but today we're at the end as in not just the end of the sermon series, but more specifically, why did the Bible end when it did? I mean, it's been about 2,000 years since Jesus rose from the dead. Where's a new word from God? Well, someone, uh, as I was previewing this message last week, uh, a church member sent me um, an obscure song from an even more obscure indie rock band that kind of gets at this very idea. The song goes like this. How long can a world go on under such a subtle God? How long can a world go on with no new word from God? See the plot of the flawed individual looking for a nod from God, trotting the side of the visible with no new word from God. So people want to know, where is God? Why isn't God speaking? Where is God in our world? And even if you look at those words, and if you think about them, they're, they're kind of depressing the way that the, the singer sings them. In fact, I think that um, they, were, they were a call for, for help, and I wish that somebody would have listened because that singer actually took his own life within a month of that song being released. And so this is, this is serious stuff. People are looking for answers. And so uh, to, to find ours today, um, we're going to need to go to the end. Uh, the way that the Bible ends in Revelation uh, 22. Um, It's probably written last, um, quite possibly written last after everything else. It certainly comes at the end, but it's, you know, a fitting that it comes at the end, considering it talks about the end. Scripture is not always that way. Scripture is not always recorded chronologically. Sometimes it's, it's by genre. Uh, what Christians call the Old Testament, we organize into um, uh, law, history, writings, and prophets. Um, Jews, it, it, hey, it's, it's their scripture, so we should probably listen to them on this. They only do law, prophets. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, law, writings, and prophets. They sprinkled the history in, so 
we should probably listen to them on that. As fast forwarding to the Christian New Testament, um, we, we go Gospels and Acts, followed by Paul's letters. He wrote a lot of them, followed by everybody else's letters. And finally, Apocalypse in the book of Revelation. Apocalypse. That's an interesting word, isn't it? It might be worth defining that word apocalypse. How many people have this image in their heads whenever they think of apocalypse? Zombies, right? You know, to be honest, there's not that much of a difference between a zombie apocalypse and a biblical apocalypse. I mean, they both portray end-time scenarios with, with images that are um, confounding to us, that are challenging to understand signs and wonders, cosmic battles between good and evil. See, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty general genre all around. Some have even said that the entire Christian New Testament is apocalyptic. You've got this coming son of man, coming to set everything right, cosmic battles between good and evil, light versus darkness, this is all characteristic of the apocalyptic genre. There's also apocalypse in uh, the Hebrew Bible as well. The second half of the book of Daniel is uh, apocalyptic in its writing style. But on to Revelation. The very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22. You heard Anne read it earlier. I'm not going to read the whole thing again. But if you were listening, I bet that a few themes popped out to you as you heard Anne read those words. First of all, that all of this is happening soon, that Jesus is coming soon. Um, we begin with, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true for the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what's, what must soon take place. And uh, see, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And again, see, I am coming soon. My re reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. So a lot of coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. But there's also an invitation there. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let everyone who hears say, come. And let everyone who is thirsty come. And let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. So putting these two themes together of both invitation and also the fact that it's going to happen soon. We close out with the one who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. We're going to focus on this for a moment. Uh, this phrase, come Lord Jesus, you said it over and over again in the call to worship today. This is a, a, an early Christian liturgy. And in fact, it's the same way not only does Revelation end this way that John wrote, but also, in addition to that, Paul ends uh, his first letter to Corinthians with this exact same phrase, come Lord Jesus. And you might have even heard uh, of uh, the name for this prayer. It's called Maranatha, all right? Maranatha, which is simply uh, the Aramaic words for come Lord Jesus. There you go. Now you know some Aramaic. Maranatha simply means come Lord Jesus. So um, the fact that all of this stuff is happening soon, I get it's been a while. I get that it's been 2,000 years and we're wondering, we're sitting around tapping our imaginary watches that, I don't know, nobody really wears anymore because we've got cell phones in our pockets and things like that. Some of you wear watches, I know that. But we're all sitting around waiting. When is soon? Well, I'm here to tell you that that soon is relative. How do I know this? Because my soon is very relative. In fact, just one day this week, I texted Rochelle, just a single word text at the end of the day, coming. My commute, for those of you who don't know, is about 100 yards, maybe less. And yet, Rochelle still had time to um, get both of the dogs on the leash, put Bryn in the stroller, take them on a walk for who knows how long, and, and I got home, and I'm like, oh, I wonder where everybody is. Uh, again, my soon is relative. Jesus soon is relative, too. In my case, um, I see a ministry leader. We catch up. I meet a new friend in the parking lot. We introduce each other. Squirrel, I don't know. I can be distracted by any number of things, but it does feel very Jesus-y, right, for him to be uh, meeting new friends in heaven and, and his return 
being delayed because of that. Who knows what Jesus is accomplishing right now? Last week, and in our topic, we talked about how he's in the business of restoring all things. That Peter said in Acts that Jesus must restore all things before he returns, as in all of creation will be restored. So soon is a bit of a relative term, but for those of us who participate in this Maranatha invitation of saying, come Lord Jesus, for those of us who participate in this Maranatha invitation of come Lord Jesus, we already have what we need. Because for those of us who truly invite Jesus in, then the Holy Spirit is with us to remind us of everything that Jesus taught us to do. And the question really becomes, how much do you want? How many words from God do you actually need? How much do you want? The same person who wrote Revelation, also wrote three general letters, also wrote an account of the life of Jesus, and he ends that account of the life of Jesus with this verse right here. Jesus did many other things as well. If all of them were recorded, I imagine the world itself wouldn't have enough room for the scrolls that would be written. Hyperbole, yes, but it gets us to a greater truth that we could record all of the things that Jesus said and did, but, but the world wouldn't have enough books to contain that. And as it is, we've got, we've got this one book. We don't read it enough. We certainly don't do it enough, and yet we want more. I get, I get that there's a river to cross, Sometimes there's a bridge over that river between our modern context and the ancient one to which it was originally written. But sometimes, sometimes that river is filled with whitecaps and, and, and the waves are simply crashing over our head. I get, I get that we want that river to cross to be a little bit easier, a little bit calmer. But this is the work that we've got to do in the meantime as we are continually inviting Jesus to come again soon. Uh, a, a pastor went to a new church, and on that first Sunday, he, <laughs> that pastor preached a sermon, and it was a beaut. There was laughter. There were tears. There was a standing ovation and an entire chorus of amens. Second Sunday comes along. Same pastor gets up, to give a sermon, and it was still very good. And the reception was still very good, but people were starting to wonder, have I heard this before? Third Sunday comes along. Again, still very good sermon, but now they're almost certain I've heard this exact message before. Fourth Sunday comes along, and they know that this preacher had the gall to get up and preach the same sermon to them four weeks in a row now. So they confront him and they say, what's up with your preaching? What was wrong with it? He asks, we're pretty sure that you're giving us the same exact message each and every single Sunday. Oh, glad you noticed. I am. Uh, He smiled. Well, aren't you going to preach something new? They asked. He responded, only whenever you do the first sermon. Friends, the truth is that none of us have fully lived into this very simple message that God has given to us, to love God as deep as we possibly can, and to love our neighbors completely. And so won't you join me as we confess that before God and each other? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.